Good morning, good morning. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, welcome to the 2017 South by Southwest Education Conference and Festival. I'm Ron Reed, the exec producer and director of the event and on behalf of South by Southwest and especially on behalf of a very hardworking and talented South by Southwest EDU team, thank you so very, very much for being here. We really appreciate it. At South by Southwest EDU, it's been our pleasure these past seven years to host the community's conversation about teaching and learning. It's a privilege we don't take lightly, nor do we do it alone. Uh, those of you who know me know I'm a pretty thankful person. Uh, I've already thanked you, for instance, for being here this morning, uh, but if you'll indulge me, uh, there are perhaps a few more thank yous I'd, I'd love to extend. Um, first off, as you know, South by uh, EDU uh, crowdsources our program. We do so via the Panel Picker platform, which uh, we release uh, every summer in Jul June and July. Um, this season, you proposed more than 1,300 sessions and workshops for us to consider. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so again, my first task is to thank you guys. Uh, we appreciate your fueling and powering the event. I also want to thank the South by EDU advisory boards who review and evaluate uh, all that goodness that you share with us and really help inform the final program. Our appreciation for their time and attention and energy uh, just can't be overstated. Uh, our deep thanks as well uh, go to the organizations that support this community by underwriting networking events, partner programming, lounges, parties, uh, and more. Uh, through their gracious support, uh, we hope to offer more than a meeting, but a learning experience that is both wide and deep and frankly second to none. And finally, I'd like to thank the more than 1,000 speakers that are on the program this year. All have contributed their time and attention in support of the broader community, uh, that they give their time freely and invest themselves so deeply to share with us all. That's what we think makes South by Southwest EDU so special. So we simply couldn't do it without their tremendous contributions. So please then join me in giving a round of applause to the speakers and advisory board members, our many sponsors, and each of you for being part of the South by EDU uh, community of ed innovators. We really appreciate it. We look forward to the days to come and as always have a few simple objectives for you. Connect, discover, impact. We encourage you to learn a lot, to expand your personal network and to have a ton of fun while you're doing it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Before we, uh, we hope that by doing these things that you're, uh, you're inspired and you're empowered to go home and really make a positive impact, uh, be it in your classroom or on your campus, in your company or your organization. Um, before introducing our opening speaker, I'll take just a minute or two to, to share that at South by EDU, the team thinks a lot about how to craft a really rich and varied learning experience for y'all. When we think of our conference sessions and workshops, those that occur here at the convention center or across the street at the Hilton or across the street that way at the JW Marriott, um, we've developed programming formats to help support a variety of learning styles. So from large room shared experiences in our keynotes uh, to longer, more in-depth, two-hour hands-on workshops and even half-day impact-oriented summits, we complement with 10-minute mentor sessions, 20-minute future 20 talks, and a variety of 30-minute stage talks throughout the program. We also think about how to help you discover innovative initiatives and solutions, so we offer an array of exhibitions. From the curated playground, which is right over there, uh, where we host immersive experiential displays, to our industry hub at the JW Marriott this year, where we have displays and talks that really uh, support the business of education. Uh, uh, also, the expo downstairs is open only to conference registrants today, but know that tomorrow it'll be free and open to the public, and we expect some six or 7,000 students and parents and local community members to come join downstairs. So uh, again, we're excited for the array of options um, 
And of course, it wouldn't be South by Southwest without a mountain of networking opportunities, including special topic meetups throughout the day, which is new this year, uh, as well as lounges, happy hours, parties, and more. And on that note, I'll say that I'll, I'll look for you later this evening at our South by EDU opening party at Buffalo Billiards, right on 6th Street. Uh, and they're hosted uh, by our friends at Renaissance Learning, which we appreciate. So finally, there are two quick things uh, I'd like to touch upon uh, uh, before introducing the speaker. Um, first, I want to highlight in our mobile app two functions. There, beneath each session description uh, are references to feedback and ask and vote. For every session, there is a feedback opportunity, and we really encourage you to complete and submit. It won't take but a sec, and we are hungry for all the feedback we can get. So please, if, if you would be so kind, know that we, uh, we uh, would be grateful. Uh, in regards to ask and vote, this is a, a tool that helps support live polling and Q&A. Um, you can, again, access that from your mobile app, or if you're working on a browser, uh, visit slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com, and enter hashtag S-X-S-W-E-D-U, and you can have the same functionality that if you open up your mobile app, you got right there. Um, so let's get to it. Um, it's a sincere pleasure to introduce our opening speaker. What I'm most excited about is that he's really exploring a space that we all find particularly compelling, and that's the intersection of culture and learning. I say we're all interested in the topic. I don't know if you noticed, but we did a pre-conference survey, and several thousand of you responded to it. And, and one of the probes was uh, uh, about culture and learning. I found it interesting that 70% of you said it was very important, and another 23% of you said it's somewhat or pretty important. So when I say I, I think as a topic, we are all intrigued and engaged by it, it's, a, it's a, fair, a fair observation. When I think of learning and culture, our opening speaker's work on reality pedagogy comes quickly to mind. A recognition that even as we put the learner at the center of our educational focus and energy, to do so successfully requires that we understand and engage with the learner in a culturally relevant and authentic way. I believe our next speaker is helping usher in a powerful way of improving schools and schooling. Right after his talk, he'll be doing a book signing at the South By Bookstore, which is in this building on level three. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor and Director at Teachers College Columbia University, and author of the best-selling book for white folks that teach in the hood, and the rest of y'all too, Reality Pedagogy in Urban Education, Please give a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Chris Hemden. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Your energy is not lit enough. I'll explain what that means later. Good morning, everybody. So, you know, you guys should know that we have the responsibility of really sort of like determining what kind of energy the rest of this conference is gonna have. And so we have to ensure that we bring a certain type of fervor and passion and power to what we bring forth for the rest of this time here. So I'll try that one more time. Invoke my, uh, my Pentecostal pedagogy and black preacher and say one more time, good morning, everybody. Now that's what I'm talking about. All right, so I don't have much time, I got a lot of things to share. But I wanna begin uh, with, a, with a sort of precursor to my talk that, that is important for us to sort of like carve out and hash out. And we always have to hash these things out whenever we're having a conversation with folks who are invested in education from different perspectives. Um, to me, being at South by Southwest EDU five years ago and then being here today really like speaks a lot to the fact that the general public is so much more engaged in discourse around education than ever before. Um, it is rare that an organization that has intentions or has sort of an origin that is much separated from education has carved out this space and then grown so exponentially. And whenever that happens, you have to understand that you're bringing folks into the fold and into the field that may not necessarily align to the core tenets of those who've been doing this education work for real, for real. Um, and so before we get into the work, I wanna make uh, you know, distinctions between the three audiences that we're gonna have here today and, and speak to each of them. So first, 
I want to speak to our friends, my friends. And my friends are those folks who understand the idea that education is essentially the civil rights issue of our time, that we cannot have conversations about education without talking about equity and diversity, um, that we can't really call ourselves educators without understanding that our work is not just about teaching, but it's about understanding the social, emotional dynamics of teaching and learning, the culture of young people, psychology, sociology, all melded together in this perfect gumbo that happens when you get into the classroom. Like, so, so I want to first of all talk to my friends who understand that. And y'all, not everybody in this room understands that. And then secondly, I want to talk to the enemies. <laughs> and we got to be clear that we have some folks in the building who are enemies. And not enemies because they're inherently bad people, but they're enemies because they come to this conversation at South by Southwest EDU because it's a time for them to be able to pitch their new product or make social connections with folks in certain spaces or talk about their new tech initiative or tech uh, company they're trying to build up or pitch stuff to schools and curriculum. And I'm just saying to you that if that's your sole intention of coming to a gathering of educators, in many ways, I'm gonna have to position you early on as not being exactly where I'm at. So you're sort of the enemy. And then lastly, or perhaps most significantly, I want to talk to the frenemies. <laughs> and under the frenemies, there are certain distinctions that have to be made there as well. See, there are frenemies who know they're enemies, but come off as friends. And these are the folks who understand all the language. They will cite you some Dewey, cite you some uh, Bygotsky, might throw in a little Piaget for measure shit. shit. They might just bring in a little Paulo Freire, and you're like, ooh, they really bought that life. <laughs> and, and, and these folks, when they come through with that kind of representation, you're like, yes, I'm with you, but, but they have ulterior motives. They, they're really more the enemies, but understand the discourse of the friends, so they position themselves as frenemies. So we gotta watch out for them cats, but they're here. <laughs> and then there's the, there's the other layer of the frenemies, and these are the folks I wanna talk to in particular today, right? Which are the folks who actually come to this work with amazing intentions, who really believe in what we said the friends believe in. But by virtue of being a part of systems and institutions and structures that do not value certain populations, they end up being enemies despite the fact that their intentions are good. And, and, and today what I want to talk about is how do we engage in a conversion of the frenemies to join the friends, to disperse the enemies from amongst our fold, and reimagine new possibilities for education. And now I can get into my talk. So the title of the talk is we got it from here, thank you for your service. And before I really like, describe to you why I chose this topic, I, I have an image under there of the Dinka tribe. And the Dinka tribe is a tribe um, in Sudan that has a very storied and powerful origin and beginning. Um, early on in their history, the Dinka actually suffered from a, a, an outbreak of sorts of tetanus. And the tetanus caused the young folks to have lockjaw. And what the locked jaw did is it literally slammed the jaws shut. And because the jaws were slammed shut, it was impossible for those young people to get the, the food and the nutrients that they needed to be able to grow. Who's following me? Okay. And so the tribe had food available, but they couldn't feed their children. So they said, we've got to do something about this. So the only thing they could think about to do something about this was they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have to literally extract out, pull out, the teeth of the young people once their teeth are formed. And they would invoke this violence on the young people, ripping out the teeth, but they ripped out the teeth because if they could rip out the teeth from the young people, then you can parse open their lips just a little bit and give them the food that they needed and they can ingest the food and then be able to survive this outbreak. You guys are following me? So it was necessary for them to be able to do this violent practice on the young people for the sake of ensuring that they got the food that they needed, the nutrients that they needed. And this goes on for generation after generation. And the young folks then learn how to eat, and, and, and they can soak in the nutrients that they need. And after a while, what happens is they, they become strong enough and they, they overcome the slack jaw. And no longer was a condition that affected their ability to be able to ingest food. However, because it had become ritualized practice to extract out the teeth of the young people from when they were young, even though there was no longer a need to do it because they can open their mouths willingly and take in the food, it had become practice to rip out the teeth so the folks in certain tribes within the Dinka would continue to rip out the teeth of the young people, not because it was essential, but because it had become tradition. In contemporary education, 
we follow that exact same model. When we think about the young folks among us who are most marginalized, who, 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 who have not been able to really sort of partake in this wealth of knowledge that we have around us today, historically, what, what happened is that we had, to, we had to rip out their teeth in order for them to learn. The ripping out of the teeth, to me, is the extraction of culture. The extraction of culture has been a necessary component of teaching in America for the sake of allowing young folks to be able to have some food, some knowledge. Y'all with me? And so this goes on for quite a while, and the teeth are getting ripped out, and, and the equivalent of teeth getting ripped out. You know Brown versus Board of Ed, the, the forced moving of a young girl into an all-white school. Why do you think the parents sent the kid to that school knowing she's going to get spit on and cursed at? Because they knew that that child needed the food of the education she could receive in the other school. I'm weaving this narrative. Y'all got to stay with me now. <laughs> All right? So this goes on for a while. And, and, and now we are in 2017. And in 2017, information is readily available to young folks who've been marginalized in school. They can go on Google and soak in the information. They can open up their windows, open up their eyes, and just see the world around them and learn. At the time, they, it was necessary for their culture to be extracted from them, for them to be able to have access to the schools who could give them the appropriate information. And today, the information is all around them. But we are still extracting out their culture in schools. We are still doing the violence that Dinka did on the young folks to get food on young people for getting knowledge in classrooms and schools. We are all collectively complicit in the process of devaluing the, 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 the natural knowledges of certain young people from certain segments of our population. And that should rattle you. That should shake you. And if it doesn't, I'm worried about you. And that should lead you to the title of this talk, which is, we got it from here. Thank you for your service. Now, does anybody know a tribe called Quest? Rest in peace, Five Dog, Q-Tip, Jerobi. Well, a couple months ago, Tribe Called Quest released an album called, We Got It From Here, Thanks For Your Service. And on that album, they, they tell these amazing narratives of, of life in urban spaces. It talks about loss, it talks about love, it talks about politics, it talks about so many amazing topics. But, but the, the title of the album was always really, really hard for, for interviewers to have a conversation with the artists about because the person who had titled the album, who was Five Dog, had passed away before the album got released. So folks would interview q and say, well, why did you guys name the album? We've got it from here, thanks for your service. And he'd say, well, I don't know. Fife made it up. Right? And as I listen to the album, and I let that album sort of pour over me, and as I listen to the themes in the album, and I thought about Five Dog and his life and his history, um, it, it started to make sense. I started sort of invoking the spirit of Five Dog to say, why would he want to name this? We've got it from here, thanks for your service. And the reason why he named it that is because there has to be a certain frustration before you get to the point where he says, no, we got it from here, thanks for your service. See that line, like, nah, we got it, thanks for your service, is essentially saying to some people, you're fired. It's saying, you've done a lot for us up until this point, and now we realize that what you think you know how to do is not good enough for us. And I think in education, where we are right now, what I want us to proclaim as we go forth for the rest of this conference is to say to folks who are enemies that we got it from here, thanks for your service. You are no longer needed. Y'all ain't with me, but you're gonna get with me. That your, that your ideas, your antiquated ideas about education that involves young folks in urban spaces having to silence themselves and their voices, is no longer gonna work. We've got it from here, thanks for your service. What Five Dog was saying was that I'm claiming ownership back over my culture. And Five Dog said that because of the ways that corporate interests had taken over hip hop. He'd seen this glorious thing he was part of in the 90s get abused and deconstructed and then reconstructed in a way that was no, there was no connection to what it initially was. He, was, he, he had become what, what Martin Luther King had called maladjusted. He'd become maladjusted to the norms in hip hop that made him say, we've got it from here, thanks for your service. And my argument for you today, if you're friends, is to become maladjusted. And if you're a friend of me, to understand that you got to get maladjusted too. The nature and structure of contemporary education has forced folks to be so adjusted to norms that do violence on young people that, it, that, that, that we got to move somewhere else. If I go to a young person who's in a hip hop cipher, who's rapping and, and showcasing energy and talking with sort of mutual entrainment with their peers and using metaphor and analogy and making cultural references in their rap, and they're absolutely brilliant when I see them on the street corner and I see them in a the classroom and they're falling asleep and can't wait to get out of there, something's wrong with the schooling system. And sometimes we gotta say to those folks, we're done with you. We got it from here. Thanks for your service. See, when folks get maladjusted. Let me describe what that means. 
A, a maladjustment is a process where you, oh, you just caught it? You just getting it? A, a, a maladjustment is a, a maladjustment is a process where you go into a place and you start asking questions about why am I doing what I am doing if I know it doesn't make sense? Why are we sitting in the keynote at South by Southwest and I'm here bringing y'all this truth and folks are still policing their reactions because they're looking at somebody next to them and saying, well, I don't know if I should clap now or yell now. Am I in church or at a conference? Look, let me tell you, you have both for the record, but let me tell you something. That what's going on here that process where, you, where you're feeling uncomfortable about my approach to describing this information to you and you're looking around not knowing what to do, what that is, is, is your body being maladjusted. And the question is this, you have to get to the point where you get maladjusted to the norms of social spaces where we talk about education to the point where you're so frustrated, you're saying to the folks who are in charge, I'm over it for you, we've got it from here, thanks for your service. And, and, and this is why I titled my book for white folks who teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too. It's, it's saying, and let's be, flip, be fair and be honest and be frank, you got white folks in urban spaces. And I'm an urban dude, so I'm gonna talk urban if you invite me, right? But there are white folks in urban spaces who are not evil people, but by virtue of not understanding the beauty and the complexity of urban spaces, end up doing violence on young people because they think they're doing good work, but they're extracting out the culture of those young people, right? We got, we got, we got folks who are in charge of the field of education who say that they're good people. We got devious devotes and her dangerous demagoguery in charge of education right now. But listen to me, what's important is this, she a friend of me because, because her construction of her identity around education is that she's a good person who's doing what is right to do for those young folks who are downtrodden. Do you understand that? That's a person who has friend ideology but enemy execution. And when you got frenemies, you got to be able to tell them, I am maladjusted to the fact that you are constru constructing a discourse around this, what we're doing, and I'm so maladjusted that you're fired. We got it from here. Thanks for your service. Amen. Right? And the implications, the implications of not being bold enough to say, I am going to be maladjusted to the structure of this space, is that you're invoking trauma on a young person. Let's go back to the dinka for a minute. Could you imagine a young person who has the ability to open their mouth? and partake in the food that's before them, who is, set, who is now forced to be part of a ceremony to extract out their teeth. Could you imagine the, the terror in that? Could you imagine the trauma in that? The trauma in being forced to go through something just because other folks say it's necessary when you know it isn't. That terror is contemporarily trauma. You understand me? And trauma is living in the, in, the, in the full bodies of the young folks who are most marginalized in schools today. Whether it's urban schools or rural schools, folks who've been pushed to the margins are undergoing severe trauma. Right now, we got PTSDs going on everywhere, undiagnosed that need to be treated. And they're a function of folks being adjusted when they need to be maladjusted. A, a President Trump stress disorder is a real phenomenon. There are folks in urban spaces, there are folks in urban spaces who, who see themselves being killed spiritually under the guise of a person who's gonna make America great again. And their notion of America being great again is circling back to a history of education where they, know they never have a voice. Y'all with me? Yeah. We're talking about the fact that, let me just get real. We're talking about the fact that even, even as educators, the, the educators that we cite the most around how to improve education, their work was born out of an era where black and brown folks did not have a voice. So, so, so when you celebrate in Dr. Seuss a couple days ago, you ain't understanding that Dr. Seuss was a person who perceived young folks of color and people of color generally as being not real, not authentic. But we celebrate their voices because those are the folks whose traditions we've inherited. Y'all with me? Wait, even an amazing pedagogue like a John Dewey is born out of an era where, even though he wants to talk about entering the child's mind, is born out of an era where particular children were not worth their mind entering into. So we're inheriting a, 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 a trauma that's been deposited into the bones of the institutions that young folks are feeling. And if you can't name that trauma and be maladjusted to it, we ain't going nowhere. A poor teaching in schools disorder. Y'all know that one too, huh? Young folks in urban spaces who know how to engage with each other, who might play the dozens with each other. Anybody know what a dozens is? Snapping on somebody. You go into a school, you have a conversation with your friend, and you snapping on them, but you know it's all love. And all of a sudden, everybody thinks it's bullying, and then they suspend you simply because they can't recognize the fact that your culture is more complex than anything they could imagine. So they're ripping out your cultural teeth while you're expressing your cultural value. That's real. That's a trauma. A, a poor treatment in society disorder. 
where a young person a couple days ago was on video show, showing her dad getting picked up by immigration officers. You don't think that has severe effects on the psyche of that young person? Then you start asking questions about why are the black and brown kids underperforming? Because we're not diagnosing the trauma that's coming because we've been adjusted to a system that imposes that trauma and that violence on those young people. Like, that's what we want to talk about today. And then I also want to talk about a post-Trayvon stress disorder. A post-Trayvon stress disorder that talks about the fact that over the last three or four years, we've seen black bodies murdered and splattered across social media on a regular basis. And when we go into schools and classrooms, we said we have to focus on content. We can't talk about those emotions. We got to focus on the standards. We, talk about, we can't talk about those emotions. And young folks are carrying those things into the classroom every single day. We're ignoring them. We've become adjusted to the fact that the young folks have trauma. Y'all with me? and keep doing the same old thing and it has direct implications on their teaching and learning. So we gotta get maladjusted enough to be able to help young folks to be able to heal from the traumas imposed by those of us that's in this room. So where do we go from here? MLK asked this question and I'm gonna humbly try to offer some solutions. And I'm gonna offer some solutions through Tribe Called Quest album, We Got It From Here, Thanks For Your Service. Is that all right? Again. I'm using tribe as my theoretical framework, <laughs> right? Because no existent framework provides me with enough tools to be able to make full sense of the complexities of urbanness and black and brownness. Y'all with me? So boom. So there's a song on an album called Say Space Program. On a space program, here are a few of the lyrics. They planning for our future, none of us been involved. Then it says, rather see we in a three by three structure with many bars, leave us where we are so they can play amongst the stars. That right there is the perception of education by the young folks who've been marginalized in schools. Do I need to deconstruct that for you? I do, let me do it. <laughs> Schooling has been framed essentially like a contemporary space program. The most ideal schools are these schools where everything is perfect and high tech. We might have more tech folks in the room than we have educators in the room today. The more you could throw technology at the phenomena, the perception is that the better it is. And a lot of folks hide under the umbrella of tech without focusing on the core of pedagogy. Let me tell y'all something. You, you, can, you, can, you can be in a classroom amongst young folks who have been disenfranchised from teaching and learning. And you may think that you're gonna be an equitable educator by providing them with the same resources that a more affluent school has. But if you use those resources in a school where you have not attacked and attached, attacked solely the core of the fact that they've been, they've been maladjusted to trauma, it's not going to work. And let me tell you what folks do in 2017. When you go into a place and you try to tech away the problem, and the problem doesn't get solved, you start blaming the young people for why they couldn't come out of it with your tech tool. Well, your tech tool ain't focused on the reality of the pedagogy that's necessary for those young people to feel actualized, and so it becomes just a waste. We don't want to teach for the space program. We don't want to teach for souls. We don't want to teach to a common core. We want to teach to a recognition of the fact that we all have uncommon cores. Y'all ain't with me because I'm preaching and y'all ain't really with me. Look, let, we also have to fully understand the fact that when we're talking about contemporary education, the only way that we can construct new spaces to really be responsive to the ways of knowing and being of young people is to do this miraculous major thing that doesn't cost a million dollars, which is engage in conversations with young people. When, a, when, a, when, when Tribe says they plan for our future, none of our people involved, that's a reality that's being experienced by young folks in urban spaces. That everybody's making decisions about what we need without engaging us in a conversation about it. And you cannot help somebody, because help is not a new thing. You can't gift somebody something. You could give somebody something and they don't want it. It might have value to you, it has no value to them. And so in my book, I write about cogenerative dialogues. I make the argument that unless we have a concerted effort to engage in critical conversations with wide swaths of the populations who we believe are underperforming, we will not get any solutions. And that's gonna require us to get rid of the hubris that comes with degrees and, and, and certifications. And shoot, let me tell you something. Don't even worry about your degrees and certifications anymore. The person in charge of education in this country ain't got the degrees you got. Why are you so concerned? The second part about it in that quote is that, leave us where we are so they can play amongst the stars. A perception amongst young people that the whole world is setting up for a different economy while they're being left in the places that they're in. Can I talk to y'all this morning? Yeah. This idea 
of, of, of preparing folks to move amongst the stars is a reality in a contemporary STEM-focused era where everybody want to be so STEM, nobody's doing science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. <laughs> the phrase that's taken on such a meaning th that's so different from what its intentions are, that, it, that it's completely separated from the idea that you want folks to engage in STEM so they could be part of the STEM economy. So you got folks who have coding academies popping up. I throw a quarter on my head somebody in this room that has a coding academy that's still starting up. And this is, this is not anti-coding academy, it's anti the perverse notion that I can go into a community, frame the charity I am giving them as opening up a new possibilities for them, when in reality I still have the low expectations of them, and I'm teaching them how to press a button and watch something jump. I can name an a coding academy, when in reality you're not cheated, te treating me or teaching me to engage fully in STEM or, or the world of computer science. You're you're teaching and treating me as though I am part of the lowest totem pole in that new economy. Look, you could, <laughs> y'all ain't feeling me. You could, you, could, you could coding academy your way into creating a new populace that's a worker in the STEM workforce. And how is that any different than creating somebody who's just a worker in the existent workforce? Don't lull me to sleep with the ideas of your charity if your intentions are not to be able to provide me with equity. So the way that we address that is by engaging in a process, not just the dialogue, but the teaching. Are we as educators going to be humble enough to create spaces to allow young people to teach us what we need to do? It's not an arbitrary phenomenon. Because y'all can say, yeah, we're going to make them teach us. But then you get to that classroom and you tell them to shut up. It doesn't work that way. I'm talking about institutions creating spaces to allow young folks to be able to take the helm of the instruction within the institution, to inform the teacher about the nuances of their culture, to be able to tell the teacher, stop ripping out my teeth and just let me be. And unless you're creating those spaces in schools, it isn't about, about black and brown youth as well, it's also about youth that we've diagnosed and labeled as not being able to achieve in schools. You're talking about young people that be called disabled, who have much ability, right? It's about young folks in Appalachia that we say they're so poor, they can't read. Song, We the People. And we the people, Tribe says, you bastards overlooking street art. Better yet, street smarts. But you keep us off the charts. Let me stop there. I'm going to deconstruct that right there. Huh? The idea that part of the issues around contemporary education is the inability of educators to understand the complexities of localized, what they perceive to be non-academic knowledge. Y'all with me? A young person in urban America who could write a graffiti piece on the wall on a bridge that could risk their life to do it, and it's in 3D, is a young person who fully understands the inverse square law in physics. <laughs> right? A young person who is in their apartment right now, downloading free software and constructing an album, and then becoming a multi-platinum selling artist, Chance the Rapper, overnight, <laughs> is a person that has, by the way, you know Chance's story is that his first mixtape was created when he was kicked out of school on suspension. You guys know that, right? I just want you to understand the connections here. When I can't fully express my brilliance on my own term in the academic space, and I get pushed out of that space, I go to reclaim another space to be able to express my intelligence and my brilliance. Now, the inability for schools to recognize the forms of brilliance expect, expressed in the non-academic spaces is not a reflection of the inability of the population, it's a reflection of the inability of the school to understand the complexity of my knowledge. Look, the goal here, and I keep telling y'all this, is, is for us to understand that we got to get young folks to feel like they are equally as ratchet as they are academic. <laughs> Some folks in here don't even know what I mean by ratchet. <laughs> the understanding that, so, 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 just a little hood dictionary, to, to, be, to be ratchet is to be, you know, in, in an urban space and fully exemplify all that folks think are the most negative aspects of urban culture, right? So I've been called ratchet a bunch of times, right? Because he loud and he talk a lot. Ain't he from Columbia? Why he saying ain't? You know, like those kind of questions. <laughs> but but I, I pride myself on being equally as academic. I'm an anthrobiochemist by training. You ask me something about chemistry, I'll flip it on you in a heartbeat. But 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 here, I, I could do it if I need to, bruh. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? I could tell you, I'm a physicist, lyricist, spitting this ridiculousness to witness the ignorance I dismiss. If Newton's laws of motion, y'all ain't even ready. But but here's the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. The point is, 
One might express a very vernacular form of discourse that is perceived as non-academic and they're treated as though they don't have the opportunity to be able to engage academically. And the more that schools can open up and allow those vernacular forms of cultural expression to be valued in academic spaces, young folks express their brilliance in schools and then attach themselves to traditional academic knowledge. Your inability to recognize that is what leads us to what we're doing today. Y'all understand me? So the goal of school is to construct and celebrate academic identities. I just hit y'all with a jewel, you ain't even know it, right? So next, it says, so motherfucking numbers and get statisticians, fuck y'all know about true competition. And, and, and it's important for me to say this here because the chief mechanism to be able to maintain some of the violence that's being imposed on young folks of color is people hiding behind fake numbers that have no meaning. Now, I'm a scientist by training, I love mathematics, but we've started this dangerous era in contemporary education where we pie chart, graph, chart our way into ignoring real problems. Yeah. And, and a lot of us are so STEM and math phobic that we allow those who are the minority in the population who say they're STEM folks to just spew these things out because you're so scared to ask questions about it. And the reason why you're so scared to ask questions about it is because you've been conditioned to believe that you're not intelligent just like you are imposing on young people. You know, broke people break people. Hurt people hurt people. We are educators. We never get the opportunity to be central in the discourse about education because there's a natural perception by folks outside of our field that we don't know what we're talking about or that we're just there because we had no other options. No, I'm here because I need to do what I need to do. I've been called to do what I would need to do. And we gotta embrace, we gotta embrace that fact. So educators go into classrooms inheriting a perception about educators from the public writ large that you are just there because you had no other options. So when you go into the classrooms and you have not troubled the fact that people see you as less than, the first thing that people do when they have power is replicate oppression. So you start treating your young students as though they are less than, and then the cycle continues. See, trauma is generational. The, the newfound research in epigenetics tells us that what we thought was just social phenomena are deeply deposited into our DNA. And if you've not healed first from your culture being enacted or extracted, you're gonna do the same processes with young folks of color. That's why the book is called For White Folks Teaching the Hood and the rest of y'all too. Because we oftentimes think that folks of color are naturally gonna be the most effective educators with young folks of color. And let me tell y'all something. We got a lot of black and brown folks walking around with white supremacist ideologies invoking violence on young people. And unless you get a chance to heal from that fact, we can't get nowhere. This is why you got folks opening up schools and urban spaces, right? And, and they frame it as if it's a choice or an option. I'm giving you an option for a better school, but it's not ever a true option because you put black bodies in charge to be the face of an oppressive pedagogy that simply just doubles down on what we know hasn't been working in the existing school. I told South by Southwest, if they want me to come, I'm gonna tell the truth. a track called Killing Season. And on Killing Season, Talib Kweli says, it's war and we're fighting for inches and millimeters. They try to stall the progress by killing off all the leaders. And the last line says, if we don't give the martyrs no more, they can't defeat us. And the goal here is this idea of cosmopolitanism. In education, we've been so enamored by the one charismatic leader that will guide us all towards the promised land, how to improve education. And, and once that happens, folks get easily swayed to do the work of the people initially and then stop doing so. But the thing is, we gotta understand that if you identify this person who's gonna be the hero and the leader, they'll get martyred and then everybody else loses. Listen, Chris Emden don't wanna be nobody's hero. I don't wanna be anybody's leader. I wanna be part of a consortium of folks who are gonna work with me as friends, as comrades, to be able to push back against the existing system. And that's why, we have Hip Hop Ed. Any, any Hip Hop Ed folks in the building? Make some noise, Hip Hop Ed. Hashtag Hip Hop Ed. Every Tuesday night on Twitter. 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern. Where we have a critical mass of educators who believe in the power and potential of youth culture that is hip hop culture and find ways to be able to connect that to education where there is no leader of that consortium. There's a critical mass of folks who are saying we're not gonna rip out the culture of young people anymore. And unless we start creating consortiums and groups and collaboratives and, 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 and connections with folks who, who, are, who are frenemies that we convert to become friends. 
Am I converting some of y'all today? I hope so. If we can't do that conversion work to make folks be able to get the stuff done, they're going to kill, keep killing the leaders and make them martyrs, and then we'll all collectively lose. Move on. Ego. <laughs> this track called Ego is a, a fascinating joint, man. It says, came up with an idea and no one seems to get it. And every time you mention it, they stay like, you, they stay like you're two-headed. But one day in your cubicle, your idea comes, really comes to view. Your boss is waking by. He says, he says it too, and he takes it from you. Y'all read that? This is fire. There are people in the world of education who are simply here to listen to good ideas and monetize off of them. Yeah. Are y'all listening to me? Yeah. And I'm all about people getting their bread, but you can't take and not give back. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Folks of color in this country have been the backbone of this country and have invented any idea about education that we could never think of. People talk about, oh, the reinvention of project-based learning. Let's construct a project-based learning uh, experiment to improve education. Post Brown versus Board of Ed, when we had separate but equal schools that were truly unequal, and you had a young uh, family who was sitting in a, in a school down the hill that was performing well, by, mind you, who, who was there with their children in a school that didn't have enough resources and we're looking up at the schools up the hill and saying, I want to be able to get my child into that school because I really care about education, and force their kids into that school. And then when the students get into that school, the students start underperforming, which is a birth of what we know today as achievement gaps, even though they were performing well in the localized schools. Well, let's look at what was happening in the localized schools. It was project-based learning before people came along and named it project-based learning and started selling project-based learning. If I'm in a school in the hood and there's a leak in the roof and I ain't got nobody to be able to fix the roof, who's going to fix the roof? The kids gonna fix the roof, their parents gonna fix the roof. And then we're gonna teach math and science and English and history through the fixing of the roof. This idea of engaging in projects around our learning experience has been part and parcel of what black and brown folks have always done since the beginning of time. The difference is, your boss is walking by, he sees it too, as he takes it from you. So the boss comes by and takes the idea and extracts out the magic of the phenomenon. Folks got project-based learning exercises that miss the whole core of project-based learning that work for young folks of color, which is that our projects was based on service learning. If I was gonna fix that roof, it's because fixing of the roof will help my school to be better. So I have a social emotional connection to not just the school, but to the activity, which now connects me to the content. Now, you got kids in the hood who's engaged in a project-based learning problem about how to create the best skis to go down a, go down a hill and they ain't never skied before. <laughs> the, ex <laughs> the extraction of context from pedagogical practices that we have done since the beginning of time ends up being the demise of these new, these new novel ideas. Y'all with me? Yeah. And sometimes you gotta say, I'm not gonna let my ideas get stolen anymore. I, ain't, I only got 17 minutes, so I, I'm, I'm going to move on, because they told me I got to make some time for questions. <laughs> so where we are now is to reimagine this age-old quote. And, and the quote was, um, you, you guys have all heard this one, right? They tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. So those of us who I said in the beginning who are friends, you know, folks try to bury us. They know we're folks of color in urban spaces. They tried to bury us. They know we were seeds. So the seeds stayed underground and the, the, seed, the, the seeds grew. And as the seeds grew, they became trees and the trees became strong and healthy. And as those trees grew, folks were like, oh man, that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to bury them. So they chopped down the tree and let the limbs of the tree fall back into the ground. And then they reburied the limbs of the tree. Y'all with me? And as they reburied the limbs of the tree, they put it back underground. And as it went back underground, it became dirty and it became mired with pressure and it turned into coal, which had less value than even the seeds to begin with. But then they tried to bury the coal underground and they added pressure to the coal underground, pressure of testing to the coal that was underground, pressure of new options in schools that don't really mean anything to the coal that was underground. And as they did this, the coal got buried underground, but the seed became a tree, the tree became a limb, the limb became wood, the wood became coal, the coal became diamonds. Because coal, under pressure becomes diamonds. And right now, for those folks who've been marginalized historically in schools, from young folks in the hip-hop generation that were told that they are anti-academic, anti-intellectual, they have nothing. We are at a point now where we know our worth. 
where we understand that we could be ratchet and make an academic spaces. You're not gonna make me feel less than because you don't know how to speak like you're from the hood. <laughs> and where we are now is understanding that we know we are diamonds. So we got it from here. Thanks for your service. Those who are going into our communities to abuse us and take out and mine our genius and tell it back to us, we got it from here. Thanks for your service. For those folks who construct and create new standards that have no true meaning because they don't connect to the culture of young people, we got it from here. Thanks for your service. Yeah. For folks who create these pop-up schools that only does violence on young people and fudge numbers so they can continue their existence while they demonize the public schools who they can invest in to do the work for young people. We got it from here. Thanks for your service. For the frenemies amongst us to have more investment in making a two-year commitment to our urban schools so they could go on and further their career because we're only a rest stop on a path towards your true life. We got it from here. Thanks for your service. No more will you allow our brilliance to feel insignificant. We got it from here. Thanks for your service. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. So I, I promised I was going to uh, leave 15 minutes for questions. I left 13 minutes and 26 seconds. Um, so there's a, there's a mechanism now that you guys can use the, um, the, the, the South by Southwest app, I believe, to ask some questions. And I think they're going to they're gonna raise up here, and I'm going to answer a couple of them. This is so fancy. You guys should see this. Oh, you, should, you see it. You do. <laughs> So the question was, how, where do you suggest we can find the right people who don't extract culture from our kids? And this is fascinating to me that this question rose up. Well, you find those folks who don't extract culture within the community. I, I recently did an essay for PBS called Why Are There So Few Black Male Teachers? And I, I was so shocked that folks were so concerned about why there are not that many black male teachers and nobody goes into the communities where black males are to train them to be teachers. It's like, yo. So how do you find folks that can teach and be educators? You invest in the community and train folks to value teaching. You invest in the community and don't create a narrative that says, when you make your way out the hood, what are you going to do? Because that's a narrative across the spectrum. You go to a basketball player. I signed my first contract. The first thing I want to do is make my way out the hood. You go to an educator who gets a good degree. I just want to make sure I move my family out the projects and make my way out the hood. Well, if everybody's making their way out the hood, who's going back to the hood to make it better? Who's going out there to improve it? Who's investing in the community? So if you want to know who is going to go back and affect things, it's going to be folks understanding that you have to marry yourself back to the community that you've been taught to demonize and reinvesting in them. And that's the path forward. Um, somebody asked, you know, I don't like asking an, uh, responding to anonymous questions, you know what I mean? But I'm going to do it anyway. Um, you know, Chris, how do we reach the enemies and frenemies? I think you, sometimes you gotta do two things. One, that's what I, what I try to do today, I just try to convert folks. When I talk about this idea of Pentecostal pedagogy, it's a real thing, there's a chapter on it in the book. You know, sometimes you gotta, you gotta be able to strike at the heart and the soul and the spirit of folks. Some folks are doing work that they know is not right to do, but in the interest of money, in the interest of survival, will follow suit. And sometimes you gotta remind people of why it is they got into this work to begin with. And it's okay for us to be able to tell those true stories about our core identities that got us to this work. Um, then also, you know, you got to also at some point shame people. <laughs> Y'all understand what I mean by that? Look, if folks who do good work are silent, then folks who don't do good work will just feel free like they could do whatever they want. If folks who do good work are saying, this is what I'm doing, this is how it's working, and I'm going to champion that, and I'm not going to be quiet about it, I'm going to be loud about it, I'm going to be unapologetic about it because it's all about the kids first. When you do that work and you, and you bring that passion to it, folks who are not really about that life get ashamed. You ever hear somebody say, tell the truth and let the devil be ashamed? Sometimes you got to tell the truth and let folks be scared. 
And so sometimes that honesty about our work is the easiest way forward. Um, friend of me here used to work at No Excuses School. When parents tell me they love the school because it's hard and preps their kid for college, what do I say? Listen, this is, this is the hard one. And, and this is the part that's the most heartbreaking for me, is that folks will demonize an existing school that has problems, construct an alternative that has more problems, and make it look real good. And folks are so thirsty for growth that if they see a uniform and a clean building, they're running towards it. And sometimes it's important for us to be able to have critical conversations with parents about the fact that they've been programmed to believe that something other than who they are is valuable. When I say trauma, y'all, y'all don't, don't understand what I mean by trauma. Do you know that young folks who send their kids to a school every day and are scared to go into that school because of the trauma they experience within that school? So sometimes, if you want to get parents to become, you got to have a critical meeting with, educate, to, with, with our parents to talk about who hurt you. When did you get disconnected from school? What made you think this was the only alternative? What makes you think that going to a school that's preparing your child for a job that only existed in 1950 is the best alternative for that child? They, the, the, the parents are reacting the way they do because they have no idea of what real options are. So when somebody says you have a choice, they're so excited because I've never been given a choice. You're giving me a choice, and they don't know they're going from the frying pan into the fire. So we have to have critical conversations with them about the reality of these experiences. You understand what I'm saying? So the, the path towards getting parents to understand the truth is to showing them what the real world looks like. Say, hey, parent, you want your child to be a part of the new economy? Well, I went to the Google offices the other day. Yeah, they rocking shorts. They listening to music. They walking around freely. And they are transforming and changing the landscape of technology but you want to send your kid to a school that makes them be so buttoned up and makes them just sit in their role attentively, well, guess what you're doing? You're not preparing them to go and to be successful in the real world because they have no idea what the real world is. We got to stand in the gap. We got to stand in the gap and introduce them to what the real world is and what it looks like. People ask me all the time, Yo, you know, Chris, you know, why, why is it that you're so, you so ratchetemic? I get asked that all the time. And I, and I say to folks, it's not because I could not adopt the knowledge and the language and the discourse of power. I got enough degrees that taught me how to do that. I could stand behind a podium the whole entire time, put my hands in my pocket, and give you a bunch of citations. That's easy. The hard part is being yourself. And there's some of us in this room right now who have learned not to be ourselves. Can I, can I, can I talk to y'all for a minute? There are people in this room right now who understand the language and the discourse of young folks. They, they listen to hip-hop music and blast it every single time that they're walking around to the school and then shut it off a block away from the building because they want those folks to think that they ratchet. <laughs> right? They're, they're folks who are policing their own self-expressions on a regular basis. And the thing is this, there's such psychological damage that you're doing on yourself by not being yourself. So you're doing damage to you, number one. But then when you go to the school and you're modeling that to young people, you're transferring that violence on them. It is possible, extremely possible, to listen to hip hop music and have a PhD. Tell young people that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's completely possible to be able to speak loud and have voice intonations that, that, that may not be appropriate in certain academic spaces and to be able to per be the person who's the smartest person in the room. The minute that we start teaching young people that you have to choose to either not be yourself or be something other than you is when we get to our collective demise. And right now, we got it from here. Thanks for your service. We could be us. We okay with that. Um, someone asked, how can we begin the conversation in a primarily white teaching community so that those humble valued spaces can be adopted? I, look, when people ask me, my OG, Gloria Latson Billings, anybody know who Glo Gloria Latson Billings is? That's, that's my academic mama. I love her so much. And she oftentimes gets this question. She, they say, well, because she's now focused on hip hop and hip hop culture and hip hop education work. See, it's so funny. A lot of y'all are really about that culturally relevant pedagogy life once it got adopted into what was going on in your graduate education program. <laughs> but you're not really about culturally relevant pedagogy life because culturally relevant pedagogy means that you are you're consistently responsive to the ever shifting expressions of culture. So you, you understand it intellectually, but you don't understand it in practice. See, the OG who championed the phrase cultural relevant pedagogy understands that the culture of young people is hip hop, so she got to go to hip hop. Y'all like, well, I, I'm a culturally relevant pedagogue, but uh, that hip hop is problematic. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? 
So the way that you, the way you talk to folks in these spaces about how to engage in this work is to say, listen, if young folks in school say, I don't want to learn Shakespeare, if Shakespeare is the conduit through which you introduce them to more literature, what do you do? Stop teaching Shakespeare? You teach it anyway. They say, I don't like hip hop, it's misogynistic and it's violent. You say, you know what? Hip hop has been the best vehicle for me to be able to teach about misogyny. <laughs> Y'all ain't ready. <laughs> that young folks who are expressing misogynistic behavior that is problematic, once I bring that hip hop text to the classroom, they're first of all shocked that I brought it in. Then I have to ask them the honest truth, this is what the music is saying, this is what you're ingesting on a regular basis, do you fully agree with that text? And then he starts saying, well, not really. Because some corporate entity, entity decided that that was gonna be what they were gonna sell back to the young folks. But if you give them the opportunity to be able to deconstruct that fully, they start realizing that's for them. Well, the same thing with white folks in predominantly white spaces. Introduce them to the complexity and the beauty of hip hop and hip hop culture. Introduce them to lyrics that might be more transformative. Utilize it as a tool to be able to engage them for. Look, the issue is this, you just can't be scared. Don't be scared, we can't get no, <laughs> we can't get nowhere if you're scared. One of the chapters in my book, it says, is courage. Sometimes you guys get to the point where we have courage about what we know is right to do. You, you think, you think it's, a, it's a appropriate and normal for me to come in here and give this talk to you this way, the way I gave it? Am I not gonna feel some repercussions? You better believe I will. When I wrote for white folks in the hood and the rest of y'all too, I got email from folks telling me I was racist. I got this email from this lady once, it was 18 pages, eight plus pages, not 18, eight pages. I printed out the email, it was literally eight pages. You are a racist, how could you say white folks? You use the word hood and, and, and all this stuff. And then the last paragraph of the book said, and when I actually, when I, when I finally read the book, <laughs> because you say white folks and folks say racist. And sometimes you gotta be have the courage for us to have these conversations openly. I'm like, yo, white folks, go home and look in the mirror. I ain't make that up. Are you white? Okay, there's some things you need to do to work in urban spaces. You see what I'm saying? And I think the openness in an era of hyper-political correctness about, about these issues, we, again, back to my topic, you get adjusted to it. People get adjusted to inequity. They get adjusted to violence. When we talk about domestic violence, one of the biggest issues around domestic violence is that the, is the, is the person who's the abusee starts making justifications for the abuse and then starts normalizing themselves to the abuse and find, they find reasons why they're being abused. They find fault in themselves for why they're being abused. And I don't at all want to minimize the, 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 the trauma, the significance of talking about domestic violence, but the world of education, educators, teachers are in a deeply abusive relationship with the structures of traditional schools. We're getting beat up. We're being told now we can't do what we know is right to do, and we start making justifications for why that institution is right. At some point, you gotta be like, no, no more. You gotta say, look, we got it from here, thanks for your service. Can we get back to this theme? I got two minutes, probably like two questions, and the way it's been going today, maybe just one question. Um, <laughs> what about private schools taking students out of their local public schools? Though a choice, do they understand what they are losing? I, I don't think folks know, and this is why I do this work, is to let folks understand that you are worthy and valuable as you are. And I'm gonna teach you with high rigor, high expectations, but the path through which I get to rigor and expectations is not through divorcing who you are, but using what you are as the path to get there. And, and you know, I, I, was, I was at a talk probably about three months ago, and I had a conversation with a guy, and he said, man, I went to school um, you know, in the 50s, and we, I remember that I had a little, uh, it was an all-white school, and we had this, this little black girl who was brought into our school. She was bussed in. And every single day, she would sit in the classroom, and she would, she would, she would literally urinate on herself. And, um, and, and then all the kids in the class would make fun of her because she was urinating on herself. And, and, and I would tell my mom about this, and my mom says, well, you just, you know, just go talk to her. And... It, it was, you know, you, the, the trauma that comes, people don't understand the trauma of being the only one. And parents will send their kids there because they're in search of an opportunity. But if the opportunity first is mired through this idea of doing this trauma and this violence on you, then it, it, it's not worth the experience. Now, I'm not saying that I want to segregate schools. What I'm saying is that if we're going to move education forward, we can't have segregation pedagogies. Y'all ain't following me? If you, if, you, if you go back to the analogy I gave you 
about the schools that were successful in, um, in, in black and brown spaces and the, the wanted to go to the other schools, you have to understand that, that we integrated the schools. We sent black kids to white schools, but we never integrated the curriculum. We never integrated the pedagogical approaches. We never integrated the community. And so you can physically integrate the schools, but without integrating the approaches, it still becomes a violent space. Now we're in 2017, the schools are more segregated than they've ever been. So now we got resegregated schools, but using the, the pedagogical frameworks of the integration schools. You see, you understand what I'm saying? So it's going to require us having a more robust approach to teaching and learning, not just in white schools and black schools, but in all schools. Because also we got to keep in mind, all students benefit. You know, at the end of the day, all youth benefit of being, to being exposed to a more diverse and robust approach to teaching and learning. All youth benefit from not having a singular assessment, right? All youth benefit from that complexity. Sometimes we, 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 we associate complexity with chaos because we view it as chaotic because it's not like what we know. But it's not really chaos, it's just complexity. You need to learn to appreciate the complexity. Um, so look, in 44 seconds, I can't answer another question, but you could tweet them to me. I'm gonna I'm be on Twitter all night long. You tweet them to me at, at Chris Emden, hashtag hip hop ed or hashtag whatever it is. But if you tweet me, I'll respond to every single question. I hope you guys have an amazing conference. Please don't take this talk as entertainment. Please take this talk as, as something in the back of your minds. <laughs> on a lens through which you look at all the sessions that you attend for the rest of this conference. And a lens through which you look at all the work that you do after you leave this conference in education. Because you know we got it from here. Thanks for your service. Other community uh, that they give their time freely and invest themselves so deeply to share with us all that's what we think makes South by Southwest EDU so special so we simply couldn't do it without their tremendous contributions so please then join me in giving a round of applause to the speakers and advisory board members our many sponsors and each of you for being part of the South by EDU uh, community of ed innovators we really appreciate it We look forward to the days to come and as always have a few simple objectives for you. Connect, discover, impact. We encourage you to learn a lot, to expand your personal network and to have a ton of fun while you're doing it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Before we, uh, we hope that by doing these things that you're, uh, you're inspired and you're empowered to go home and really make a positive impact, uh, be it in your classroom or on your campus, in your company or your organization. Um, before introducing our opening speaker, I'll take just a minute or two to, to share that at South by EDU, the team thinks a lot about how to craft a really rich and varied learning experience for y'all. When we think of our conference sessions and workshops, those that occur here at the convention center or across the street at the Hilton or across the street that way at the JW Marriott, um, we've developed programming formats to help support a variety of learning styles. So from large room shared experiences in our keynotes uh, to longer, more in-depth, two-hour hands-on workshops and even half-day impact-oriented summits, we complement with 10-minute mentor sessions, 20-minute future 20 talks, and a variety of 30-minute stage talks throughout the program. We also think about how to help you discover innovative initiatives and solutions, so we offer an array of exhibitions. From the curated playground, which is right over there, uh, where we host immersive experiences. I say we're all interested in the topic. I don't know if you noticed, but we did a pre-conference survey and several thousand of you responded to it. And, and one of the probes was uh, uh, about culture and learning. I found it interesting that 70% of you said it was very important and another 23% of you said it's somewhat or pretty important. So when I say I, I think as a topic, we're all intrigued and engaged by it. It's a, it's a, fair, a fair observation. 
When I think of learning and culture, our opening speaker's work on reality pedagogy comes quickly to mind. A recognition that even as we put the learner at the center of our educational focus and energy, to do so successfully requires that we understand and engage with the learner in a culturally relevant and authentic way. I believe our next speaker is helping usher in a powerful way of improving schools and schooling. Right after his talk, he'll be doing a book signing at the South By Bookstore, which is in this building on level three. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor and Director at Teachers College Columbia University, and author of the best-selling book for white folks that teach in the hood, and the rest of y'all too, Reality Pedagogy in Urban Education, please give a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Chris Emden. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Y'all energy is not lit enough. I'll explain what that means later. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So, you know, you guys should know that we have the responsibility of really sort of like determining what kind of energy the rest of this conference is going to have. And so we have to ensure that we bring a certain type of fervor and passion and power to what we bring forth for the rest of this time here. So I'll try that one more time invoke my, uh, my Pentecostal pedagogy and black preacher and say one more time, good morning, everybody. Good now that's what I'm talking about. All right, so I'll have- Experiential displays to our industry hub at the JW Marriott this year where we have displays and talks that really uh, support the business of education. Uh, uh, also, the expo downstairs is open only to conference registrants today, but know that tomorrow it'll be free and open to the public and we expect some six or 7,000 students and parents and local community members to come join downstairs. So uh, again, we're ex excited for the array of options. Um, and of course, it wouldn't be South by Southwest without a mountain of networking opportunities, including special topic meetups throughout the day, which is new this year, uh, as well as lounges, happy hours, parties, and more. And on that note, I'll say that I'll, I'll look for you later this evening at our South by EDU opening party at Buffalo Billiards, right on 6th Street, uh, and they're hosted uh, by our friends at Renaissance Learning, which we appreciate. So finally, there are two quick things uh, I'd like to touch upon um, uh, before introducing the speaker. Um, first, I want to highlight in our mobile app two functions. There, beneath each session description uh, are references to feedback and ask and vote. For every session, there is a feedback opportunity, and we really encourage you to complete and submit. It won't take but a sec, and we are hungry for all the feedback we can get. So please, if, if you would be so kind, know that we, uh, we uh, would be grateful. Uh, in regards to ask and vote, this is a, a tool that helps support live polling and Q&A. Um, you can, again, access that from your mobile app, or if you're working on a browser, uh, visit slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com, and enter hashtag S-X-S-W-E-D-U, and you can have the same functionality that if you open up your mobile app, you got right there. Um, so let's get to it. Um, it's a sincere pleasure to introduce our opening speaker. What I'm most excited about is that he's really exploring a space that we all find particularly compelling, and that's the intersection of culture and learning. Not much time, I got a lot of things to share, but I want to begin uh, with, a, with a sort of precursor to my talk that, that is important for us to sort of like carve out and hash out. And we always have to hash these things out whenever we're having a conversation with folks who are invested in education from different perspectives. Um, to me, being at South by Southwest EDU five years ago and then being here today really like speaks a lot to the fact that the general public is so much more engaged in discourse around education than ever before. Um, it is rare that an organization that has intentions or has sort of an origin that is much separated from education has carved out this space and then grown so exponentially. And whenever that happens, you have to understand that you're bringing folks into the fold and into the field that may not necessarily align to the core tenets of those who've been doing this education work for real, for real. Um, and so before we get into the work, I want to make uh, you know, distinctions 
between the three audiences that we're going to have here today and, and speak to each of them. So first, I want to speak to our friends, my friends. And my friends are those folks who understand the idea that education is essentially the civil rights issue of our time, that we cannot have conversations about education without talking about equity and diversity, um, that we can't really call ourselves educators without understanding that our work is not just about teaching, but it's about understanding the social, emotional dynamics of teaching and learning, the culture of young people, psychology, sociology, all melded together in this perfect gumbo that happens when you get into the classroom. Like, so, so I want to first of all talk to my friends who understand that. And y'all, not everybody in this room understands that. And then secondly, I want to talk to the enemies. <laughs> and we got to be clear that we have some folks in the building who are enemies. And not enemies because they're inherently bad people, but they're enemies because they come to this conversation at South by Southwest EDU because it's a time for them to be able to pitch their new product or make social connections with folks in certain spaces or talk about their new tech initiative or tech uh, company they're trying to build up or pitch stuff to schools and curriculum. And I'm just saying to you. Good morning, good morning. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, welcome to the 2017 South by Southwest Education Conference and Festival. I'm Ron Reed, the exec producer and director of the event, and on behalf of South by Southwest, and especially on behalf of a very hardworking and talented South by Southwest EDU team, thank you so very, very much for being here. We really appreciate it. At South by Southwest EDU, it's been our pleasure these past seven years to host the community's conversation about teaching and learning. It's a privilege we don't take lightly, nor do we do it alone. Uh, those of you who know me know I'm a pretty thankful person. Uh, I've already thanked you, for instance, for being here this morning, uh, but if you'll indulge me, uh, there are perhaps a few more thank yous I'd, I'd love to extend. Um, first off, as you know, South by uh, EDU uh, crowdsources our program. We do so via the Panel Picker platform, which uh, we release uh, every summer in Jul June and July. Um, this season, you propose more than 1,300 sessions and workshops for us to consider. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so again, my first task is to thank you guys. Uh, we appreciate your fueling and powering the event. I also want to thank the South by EDU advisory boards who review and evaluate uh, all that goodness that you share with us and really help inform the final program. Our appreciation for their time and attention and energy uh, just can't be overstated. Uh, our deep thanks as well uh, go to the organizations that support this community by underwriting networking events, partner programming, lounges, parties, uh, and more. Uh, through their gracious support, um, we hope to offer more than a meeting, but a learning experience that is both wide and deep and frankly, second to none. And finally, I'd like to thank the more than 1,000 speakers that are on the program this year. All have contributed their time and attention in support of the brand